Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today um, for our corn fertility and times of high fertilizer prices webinar today. We've got three webinars after today remaining in our series. You see the titles of some of those listed on the screen right now. Um, same process to get registered for those if you're not already. Um, Today we have Janice Degney with us as a speaker, my colleague in central New York. Janice is a regional agronomist for Cornell Cooperative, Cooperative Extension for several counties in the south central portion of the state. She is an excellent general agronomist, but her favorite topics uh, revolve around integrated crop management, crop management, crop planning, rotation planning, environmental in, uh, impacts, uh, et cetera. And so Janice is with us today to zoom in on uh, corn fertility management uh, to keep efficiency high and fertilizer costs low. We'll ask you if you have questions at any point during the day today to go ahead and type those into the Q&A <clears throat> box on the bottom. Jeff and I will try to monitor those if we can answer them directly in writing ourselves in the Q&A box, we will. Um, and we'll save the rest of them for any pauses in Janice's uh, presentation or for the end. So I think we're ready to take it away, Janice. Thank you, Kitty. Good afternoon. I have an ambitious outline today. My intention is to provide some ideas and scientific principles that can help you meet a goal of providing needed facility for your corn crop that makes use of all on-farm and soil nutrient resources to optimize fertilizer costs using realistic yield goals, while providing a balance between production needs and environmental stewardship. Sounds like a tall order, doesn't it? <clears throat> so um, we all know we're experiencing increased expenses across the board, labor, parts, fuel, et cetera, et cetera, and fertilizer. The good news is if we look at um, where fertilizer was last winter, we'll look at ure urea, the um, gray line here, which is a common fertilizer, we've actually come down some. And we're down in the 700, come down from 900 to $700. Actually, I think urea was more like a thousand or more dollars a ton last year. Um, so we're coming down to a kind of historic high rates in the six to $700 range. <clears throat> and this, this is a, a national chart, but I think that's pretty representative of some of the numbers we've heard from local retailers. So in a, in a dairy or livestock situation, we have to balance our crop production where we can meet our feed inventory needs. Because if we don't produce enough of our homegrown forages and we have to purchase, we're gonna either pay to grow good yields through fertilizer, or we're gonna pay on the other side, purchasing feed. So, and, and if you're a grain farmer without livestock, you need to turn a profit to maintain and grow your business. So we're trying to find that, that sweet spot. So, how can we make the best use of our fertilizer dollar? Step one, know the fertility status of your soils. We need soil tests to do that. And if we're in a state where we've been fertilizing regularly over time, can we back off a little in a year when prices are super high and rely on that bank of nutrients in the soil? So in the bottom left-hand corner, you see a, an example of a soil test. And most soil tests will give us some kind of rating on where that, the number that they came up in the test, where it falls on the scale of low to high in terms of nutrient availability. Do we have a manure in our system? If we do, we know that can offset a lot of the nutrient need, particularly for nitrogen, but also phosphorus and potash. And also the bonus of micronutrients that are in the manure. Um, so that can really help us reduce our fertilizer bill. And the chart to the right is just showing that our mineral 
the mineral portion of our soil, our negatively charged clay particles and organic matter fraction in the soil provide a reserve of nutrients that's, that's there. And this is just a, an example of what that might look like. There's a certain amount held in the soil. Um, some of that will become available to the plants in any growing season. So I just wanna start with soil testing. We need to have our soil test, our soil tested so that we know what it, where our fertility lies. Now with our land grant college of Cornell, we use the sufficiency approach for nutrient guidelines. And these are based on results from yield trials on New York soils that are correlated with soil test results. Soil testing, it just, Everybody knows about it, but it's a little bit complicated because there are different soil test methods. And you can see that different labs will just have different, slightly different protocols. So a lot, a lot of times they're not directly comparable. And that's what you're seeing here, that just the methods in the lab, shaking time solution, et cetera, et cetera, will create differences. One of the biggest sources of difference is the actual extraction solution used to determine what, our, what the nutrient availability in the soil is of our different nutrients for plants. So <clears throat> there are four main uh, extractants. And if you look at this list from Morgan, modified Morgan, Malik, and Bray, we go from a weaker solution up to a very strong solution. So a stronger solution will get a larger amount in their measurement, but will that be adequate for your environment? So in New York State, scientists in the past from Cornell have determined that Morgan is the most appropriate so, uh, extractant for our, what are considered younger soils. They're only as old as the last ice age. Whereas uh, some of the other soils that weren't under ice are much older, much more weathered, and it takes a stronger solution to extract those nutrients. So this is just an example of the results of a single soil sample that was split into four subsamples and sent to four different labs using four different solutions and the kind of results you can get. So with the Morgan, we had six, and with the Bray, we had a result of 57 pounds per acre. So how do you interpret that result? Is it meaningful in your in your particular situation? <clears throat> so if you have used um, the Cornell system, which uses the Morgan extractant, they've correlated different soil test levels with yield response studies. And so what this table is showing is the breakdown and rating of um, different levels of phosphorus in the soil. So if you're at the one to three on your results, that's considered very low. And once you get above nine, it's high. And once you get, and then there's kind of this high plus zone between nine and 39. And once you get up to 40 or more, that's considered very high. And you can see fertility recommendations drop to zero. And when you're in this very low zone, they're recommending about 65 pounds of phosphorus to make up for the fact that there's very little in the soil. So these numbers, the recommendations, um, were determined as a result of many yield response studies across uh, different crops and soils in New York State. So this is an um so the other thing about soil testing, we have different fertilizer philosophies and the recommendations that go with the soil testing results. So there's the build and maintain, which is really doesn't even rely on the soil test levels, but is based on crop removal rates. Sometimes we um, refer to that as feeding the soil. And then there's the land grant system across the country that uses the sufficiency approach which is about meeting the crop needs, not necessarily building soil fertility, and also trying to strike a balance between production and minimizing environmental losses. 
And that's all backed up with years and years of research. And that's sometimes referred to as feeding the crop. And then the third philosophy that's kind of fallen out of um, favor is the base cation saturation ratio theory. And it, it says that there should be a certain ratio between your calcium, magnesium, potassium ions, but research has never been able to verify that those ratios correlated to any type of yield impacts. So this is just showing the basic setup for if you have very low soil <clears throat> levels of whatever nutrient, as you add more fertilizer, your yields will go up. And at some point, yields hit a plateau and additional fertilizer does not give you additional yield or something else that's limiting yield. And then these are the fertilizer. You can see fertilizer rates go down as soil fertility goes up. Uh, this is a table showing the typical crop removal for phosphorus and potassium. So this can be useful just to know how much P and K a crop needs. And most land grants have published a table like this, this particular table I took from the Penn State Agronomy Guide. And it's telling us we need four tenths of a pound of P205 equivalent for a bushel of corn, three tenths of a pound of potash. For silage, it's four pounds per ton or eight pounds of potash per ton. And then here's just some standard yields and how much um, nutrient would be needed to meet that 150 bushel yield. So <clears throat> this is a graph of a nitrogen response. So we all know that corn is a huge nitrogen feeder. So I wanted to focus on nitrogen in this talk. I don't want to ignore the other nutrients, but nitrogen is so important. I really want to just uh, emphasize some of the important points with nitrogen. So in this graph, we see that even without any fertilizer, we still get some level of production. And this particular graph is showing both a low yield and a high yield site. So the other, the next point is that we get the greatest response in yield to the earlier rates of fertilizer. So you can see here at 40 pounds, we're gaining 35, an additional 35 bushels over the zero level. And at the high yield site, we gain uh, 28 bushels with 40 pounds of fertilizer. Now, we, if we jump up at 80 pounds, we're seeing this is our yield. If we go to 120 pounds, we see these are our yields. So at 120 pounds of fertilizer, we're only gaining five bushels of additional yield at the low site and 18 bushels at the high site compared to the huge increases back here at the first 40 pounds where we were getting 35 bushels and 28 bushels. So subsequent additions of fertilizers give lower and lower rates of increase. And at some point yield maxes out and any additional fertilizer doesn't contribute to yield and then is available potentially for loss and environmental contamination. Or there may be some other factor outside of, in this particular example, nitrogen, that's limiting yield. And the other thing that makes this whole thing about nitrogen a little bit difficult is yield can be impacted greatly by the growing season. We have a dry growing season, yield potential typically goes down. And if we have a super wet season, yield potential may go down. So nitrogen is constantly, nitrogen needs are constantly moving and shifting as a result of both, you know, the soil conditions, your hybrid, and uh, the weather. So it's it's a constant balancing act and trying to find the right spot that meets your needs. So I kind of, the red face, the sad red face is kind of showing the factors that we don't have control over that can impact us. And on the other side, we have some of the things we can control. So we can't control the cost of fertilizer, but what can we do in our system that to, to manage that, that we can control? 
And in this talk, we're talking about using farm nutrient sources of manure, cover crops, and things like that. So last year when fertilizer prices were really super duper high through the roof, Ontario researchers recommended a 15 to 20 pound decrease in nitrogen rates. And they based that on the average of 10 years of maximum economic rate of nitrogen studies. So they were able to evaluate those changes due to weather conditions and things like that over 10 years and gave a pretty uh, conservative rate of decrease. You don't wanna decrease things cut so much that you end up negatively impacting yield. So I wanna move into how much nitrogen does a corn crop need? And uh, back in the 1990s, the National Corn Handbook, which was a publication out of Purdue, uh, told us that we need 1.2 to 1.3 pounds of nitrogen per bushel of corn. And that has been the standard rule of thumb for the last 30 to 40 years. But what we're finding today is that our new hybrid and our new hybrids are much more efficient in their use of nitrogen that they do take up. So this picture is showing to the left uh, an early corn hybrid from 1958 compared to a modern, a more modern hybrid from 2015. And the main thing that you see is that our new hybrids have this stay green effect. And it actually helps them to photosynthesize longer into the growing season. And this is contributing to uh, the more efficient use of nitrogen in the corn crop, by the corn crop. So uh, in this study that I've cited here, they determined that modern hybrids are meeting the challenge from gene with genetic improvement. And over the last 70 years, they've achieved an 89% increase in grain yields and a 73% increase in nitrogen use efficiency. So modern hybrids are better at accumulating a greater percent um, of applied nitrogen fertilizer, limiting environmentally damaging losses, while more efficiently producing grain yield per unit of N that's taken up. And that sounds like a win-win to me because we're able to get the yield we need with lower rates of fertilizer and lower, lowering our potential for losses through runoff and leaching. So the, the, the message from that is we're essentially not creating um, losses in the, environmental, in the environment while realizing much higher yields. The turn of the century yields were around 100 bushels to eight per acre. Today, uh, we're finding 200 bushels per acre in this region more common. So how do they do this? So what they have learned is that the stay green quality in the stem is contributing to photosynthesis in the upper leaves later in the season. And <clears throat> even though the stems contribute very little to photosynthesis, they're a great store of sugars that they can then feed up to the leaves to keep the leaves going and photosynthesizing. Okay, so this is kind of what I'm thinking is the meat of my presentation today. How do we determine how much nitrogen our crop needs? So we have these formulas and these, these um, formulas come from the nitrogen guidelines for New York State that Dr. Green Ketterings has recently updated. So we'll run through the equation. So how much nitrogen do we need? It's a factor of a, our yield index um, times the efficiency factor of nitrogen. I'll just show you that table quick, what that looks like. 
So you can see, whoops, you can see here, we'll just look at the corn grain here, 100 and at lower yields, we actually have a higher need for M. So we're back at the standard 1.2 pounds of M per acre. But as yield increases, and we, um, we find that those hybrids that are high producers only need 85.85% of um, a pound of nitrogen. So it degre decreases dramatically the more productive the uh, corn is. And we see the same exact pattern in silage. A lower yielding silage, 16 tons, about 11 pounds of nitrogen, and up at 25 tons, 7.7 .7 pounds of nitrogen. I'm going to go back now. So then, <clears throat> so we have that. Then we subtract the nitrogen that comes from our soil organic matter. Then we can subtract any nitrogen contributed by a plow down sod for up to three years. And that's divided by the nitrogen efficiency, nitrogen use efficiency of the soil minus any soybean nitrogen credits from a soy rotation or cover crop inputs. So the equation is the same, has all the same factors for silage. We just have a different yield index number we would use. Um, one of the caveats is that if you are working with no-till fields, you should add an additional 20 pounds to the final amount from the equation. So how do you come up with your yield? I mean, a lot of people, have, well, today more and more yield monitors are common, but if you don't have yield monitors, you can maybe weigh some representative loads, count loads. Uh, if you can't do that, do it with the rough forage inventory calculation. So you measure the tonnage in your storage divided by the acres harvested. And in the Southern tier, we often have two tiers. We have valley ground and hill ground with two very different uh, points of yield potential. So I showed that. And um, <clears throat> this is just to say that these numbers were supported by data that was collected in, over the past five to six years from 230,000 acres of corn in New York State. So going back to the equation, the first point is the nitrogen provided by the soil organic matter. And that can range from 40 to 80 pounds, depending on your soil type. Also, um, if you're a dairy that has had years of manure, your organic matter is typically going to be between somewhere between three and a half to five percent. And when you're at those levels, it's these levels of nitrogen from the organic matter are pretty dependable. And the soil's end supplying capacity is a function of soil type and artificial drainage class, which I'll show you in the nitrogen tables in a minute. And of course, organic matter turnover is dependent on a lot of different factors, things like temperature, pH, microbe population, uh, status of aeration in the soil compaction, things like that. So those things can affect you know, how, how well your organic matter turns over. So just taking a step back and looking at nitrogen in the nitrogen cycle, why it's such a different, difficult nutrient to manage, because it's so mobile and active. But if we start up here in our atmosphere, we are, we're breathing in a lot of nitrogen with every breath we take. So there's plentiful nitrogen in the atmosphere. It's about 78%. Some of that, we have these nitrogen-fixing bacteria, our rhizobium that we add to our legumes, can take that nitrogen gas and convert it to a plant-usable form, to ammonium for the plant to take up. And then when those plants are, are plowed in, they can release a large amount of nitrogen back to the soil for us. Um, there are nitrogen fixing bacteria that can take nitrogen from the air and convert it to ammonium. 
And ammonium is a stable, what we would call a stable form of nitrogen because it has a positive charge, so it can be held by the soil particles. But then ammonium undergoes conversion with the process of nitrification with bacteria, with two stages of bacteria breakdown to create nitrates. So nitrates is the plant, easily plant available form of nitrogen. Uh, their preferred form of nitrogen. But the problem with nitrate is it has a negative charge. So it's not held tightly by the soil particles and we can lose it with any heavy, heavy uh, precipitation that occurs. And then if we have a situation where we have waterlogged soils, we can lose our nitrogen through denitrification back up into the atmosphere. So again, this constantly changing soil environmental conditions makes estimating mineralization rates, the turnover of nitrogen from organic sources difficult because it's, all, it's a moving target. Let's take a moment to talk about urea. This is one of our key nitrogen fertilizers. When urea is top dressed, it's susceptible to losses through volatilization. So we've always recommend, if you're gonna top dress in the spring, say you're going out at green up to top dress weed or top dress a hay field, you wanna try to apply it either very close to predicted rain or even in the rain so that it gets washed into the soil. Because once the urea is moved into the soil or just in with soil, uh, it converts rapidly to ammonium so again, that's a stable form of nitrogen in the soil. So that's held by the soil. And um, what happens when it sits on the soil surface, it comes in contact with the enzyme urease, which breaks it, the urea molecule down. So the ammonia escapes and it doesn't further, it, we lose it through uh, ammonia volatilization. So your urea applied to the soil reacts with water and the soil enzyme urease, which is present in bacteria, it's present on crop residue and it rapidly converts ammonium uh, to ammonia and it's lost. So up, up to 60% of the nitrogen in urea can be lost by ammonia volatilization if the conditions are right, if it's temperatures are warmer, if there's a breeze, uh, if there's a lot of soil residue. So if people are gonna top dress and they don't see a rain in the forecast, we often recommend that you use a urease inhibitor. And we'll, that's NBPT is the chemical, but we know it as through the common name, agrotain. And what that does is it, stops that urease enzyme from being able to break down the urea as rapidly. It's active for about two weeks. So hopefully, normally, we would have enough rainfall to wash that urea into the soil within two weeks. Um, you need about somewhere between a quarter and a half inch of rain to get that urea into the soil. Uh, so the other issue with nitrogen fertilizers is once it's in the soil, it, it can convert to nitrate and we don't wanna lose that nitrate in leaching. So as an example, if we put all our nitrogen up front, it's very vulnerable because the crop isn't gonna be ready to really use that nitrogen for maybe up to a month. And if we start to get heavy rains in that, that period between planting and when corn is starting, let's say eight to 12 inches tall, we can lose a lot of that nitrogen from the system through leaching. So that's when we would wanna consider a nitrification inhibitor. Um, so uh, Super U has both the urease inhibitor and the nitrification inhibitor. So you're protected for both, from both sources of loss. And you see here some other examples 
and serve an instinct and guardian uh, as nitrogen nit nitrification inhibitors. So just uh, something to think about. If you are applying excess rates of nitrogen, you don't really get the benefit of inhibitors because you've already you've already invested money in too much fertilizer and you're protecting it. So this, a lot of times to get the benefit of an inhibitor, it's recommended that you cut your rate back a little because you're going to gain more of the nitrogen from the product. Okay, this is a, an example of a typical Southern tier series of soils that you'll find together in the landscape and how they're rated by the New York State Soils Database. So all our soils are divided up into soil management group based on their texture. So we have group one soils, which are heavy clays, fine textured soils up to group five soils, which are coarse textured soils, uh, gravelly and sandy soils. So the group three soils are uh, considered silt loams. Then we have the drainage on the different soils. So these are all in the landscape together typically. And we go from a well-drained soil, we can go from a well-drained soil to a somewhat poorly drained soil to a moderately well-drained soil. And those characteristics affect their N, their efficiency, so the in uptake of nitrogen. Um, so you can see in a more poorly drained soil, there's a difference between a drained soil, which means it has tile drainage in a, in a native soil with no additional drainage. Um, that also can affect the nitrogen supply. So these are the numbers we use for the potential nitrogen from the organic matter, whether the field is drained with tile drainage or not. And then here are the yield indices for corn grain and corn silage, and they can vary based on uh, drainage or undrained. So this is just an example of a typical soil series, maybe along the Finger Lakes that has a natural high pH from, because it's rich in lime in the soil. So it's in the lime belt. And so the, these are mostly group two soils, Palmyra and Phelps, our gravelly soils, group three soils. And you can see we have, we have these figures for every soil that has been um, mapped in the state. So what I'm trying to do is go through the pieces of the equation to, for calculating this nitrogen value. So we have our contributions from sod and we know we'll have three years of value from the sod and the rates will depend on how much legume. So we have 100% grass, up to 50% or more legume could be red clover, could be, could be alfalfa. And then in, if we're doing a corn soybean rotation, the numbers for soybean are not as um, firm as the numbers for our, our hay crops that we terminate, but the value falls somewhere between a half and one pound of nitrogen per bushel of yield. And conservatively, we're using 20 to 30 pounds per acre in the nitrogen formula. If you've got, you know, averages well above or uh, yields well above average, you might want to bump that number up a little. And these are fairly new, a new addition to the formula, the cover crop contributions, but this is based on, uh, you know, a decade of research. Uh, so if we've got a like a rye cover crop over the winter or a triticale cover crop, that crop's able to um, conserve for about 20 to 30 pounds of nitrogen, which can then become available for the farm crop planted the following spring. And then if we have legume cover crops, and these two are referring to legumes, depending on when it's seeded or interseeded into a small grain, we can get anywhere from 40 to potentially over 100 pounds of nitrogen from a red clover cover crop. And this is uh, what this is talking about down here is just kind of a precautionary message about 
turning under mature mature uh, hover crap. For example, if a rye crap gets away from you and it gets headed out, then the carbon to the carbon will be much higher in the crap and it's going to be slower to break down and may actually need to cause some immobilization of nitrogen while the microbes try to break that tougher material down. So the last part of the equation is the, the impact of manure. So this is a typical, just an example of a manure analysis. You can see we've got uh, 35 pounds of total nitrogen per thousand gallons, 16 pounds in the ammonium fraction, which is the inorganic fraction, 19 pounds in the organic fraction, about 15 pounds equivalent uh, fertilizer of phosphorus per thousand gallons, and 27 pounds of potash equivalent per thousand gallons. We have two fractions in manure. We have the urine or the ammonium fraction. So the ammonia fraction we know can be lost easily. And then we have the solid or semi-solid portion of the manure, which is provides the organic fraction which is slowly broken down over time, somewhat like the perennial sod, and provides nitrogen for up to three years on a, uh, in a decay series. So this is showing the decay series if we look at the cow manure here with less than 18% dry matter. This is our typical rates we expect. 35% of the organic fraction the first year, 12% the second, the following year, and 5% the year after that. As far as the ammonia fraction, it has to be, the manure has to be incorporated as quickly as possible to conserve as much of the ammonia and to get it converted to ammonium where it'll be held by the soil. So if it's injected during the growing season, 100% of that nitrogen in the crop will be, in the manure will be conserved. When we're going out in the spring and spreading, if we can incorporate within 24 hours, we can conserve 65% of that. And every day we lose about 10% after that. The problem with injection in the fall is yes, the manure can get injected in the soil where the ammonium supposedly will be stable, but there's so much rain and snow between fall and spring that most of that nitrogen will be lost through leaching. Okay, so now I wanna walk through some equations. And with this, I'm just starting with, okay, what's the value of our manure in this situation? So we've got 13 pounds of ammonia nitrogen per thousand gallons, 15, in the organic fraction, 12 pounds of phosphorus and 33 pounds of potash per 1,000 gallons. And then I've got the math all set up here for different rates of manure from 1,000 up to 12,000 gallons per acre. And it's divided between the um, fraction here is the inorganic and the organic portion. And then you can see the P and K level. So at 1,000 gallon, gallons, this is the P and K we're getting. If we go up to 8,000, this is this, the amount. And if we went back to that table that said, what's the nutrient uptake of a typical corn crop? I think the phosphorus was around 50 pounds for 150 bushels. And the potash was maybe 150 or something like that. So, and then just a reminder that we're going to get a contribution from our sod that we plow down and then some scenarios. So here's uh, a field with a 20 ton yield potential by, and this is from the yield index table, 9.5 pounds of N per ton. So to grow this corn crop, we need a total of 190 pounds of nitrogen. We can get 60 pounds supplied by the breakdown of our soil organic matter year in and year out. We can take anything from a plow down hay crop, perennial sod for up to three years. So in this scenario, we're greater than 50% alfalfa. It gives us 165 pounds of nitrogen that first year. 
Then we add a little starter and we see that we have excess nitrogen without any additional uh, fertilizer beyond the starter and first year corn. That's probably not a su big surprise. That's a typical scenario when any kind of legume sod, any level of legume sod is plowed down. And if we move out, we see that as time and our rotation and contribution is smaller, we can make up some of that with manure. So in this scenario, 5,000 gallons of manure is giving us 90. This is incorporated within 24 hours, giving us 94 pounds of nitrogen. And again, no additional nitrogen needed for second year corn or sat. Um, and third year corn, we're dropping in our rotation end, keeping our starter static, keeping the manure the same, and we still have adequate nutrient to grow that crop with the addition of the 5,000 gallons of manure. This is looking at continuous corn with and without manure. And you can see when we don't have manure in the system, we have this need of 129 pounds of nitrogen that will have to be provided through a side dress application. But in the scenario where we have 8,000 gallons of manure incorporated within 24 hours, we're only, we're only short 19 pounds of nitrogen, which I would say for me personally would be on the line of saying that's fine. If the season is right, the soil will make up for that 19, but if somebody's not comfortable with that, they can do a light side dress to make up for that. This is a scenario with a high yield, 30 tons of silage, and the factor that goes with that, which is reduced from the nine and a half for the low, low yield to 7.7. .7. So for this crop, we need 231 pounds of nitrogen. We have our organic sources. We have our rotation. So in this scenario, I switched it to 100% grass legume. So this number is lower that first year. I kept the starter at 30 pounds. Oh, I even threw on 8,000 gallons of manure because um, sometimes if our grass is pretty worn out, we're gonna have a deficit. But in this case, we're actually uh, oversupplying 52 pounds of nitrogen. Moving into second year corn, uh, keeping things the same. Of course, the rotation end goes down, 8,000 gallons of manure. We're still, and now we've got uh, the 12% of last year's manure application added in here. So an additional seven pounds. So we're in excess by six pounds. So that's what I would consider fairly balanced. And then as we move into the third year, we're still at a, we're short 18 pounds of nitrogen, which as I said earlier, is right on the fence of whether you really need to worry about it or not. So daily spread, what's the, what's the difference if we're relying on daily spread manure? Basically we've lost all our ammonia portion. So we, we only have the organic portion to rely on. So again, here's um, the manure value and we're discounting any ammonia because that's either going to be lost on the floor in the barn or lost as it's spread in the field and is sitting out to the uh, elements in the field. So we have a 20 ton yield potential. We need 190 pounds of nitrogen to grow the crop. We're getting 60 from the soil organic matter. We've plowed down. Uh, a worn out alfalfa sod, but we still have an estimate of one to 25% legume in it. So that's gonna give us 110 pounds of nitrogen. I lowered the starter to 20 pounds. And in this scenario, we're good to go. We've got enough nitrogen from our plow down sod. In second year corn, we have our 24 pounds from the sod, or 60 pounds from the organic matter, 24 pounds from the sod, 20 pounds from the starter, we need an additional 86 pounds of nitrogen. And 
are 8,000 gallons of manure without any ammonia fraction, only supplies 37 pounds. So we need almost 50 pounds. We have a little bit of residual. Oh, that's that actually shouldn't be there. We So we need an additional 50 pounds of nitrogen for that second year crop when we move to daily spread. And then in the third year corn, we are coming out um, with a need for 63 pounds. Well, we do have the residual end from this year's application, which gave us 18 pounds at 12%. So we're short 45 pounds of nitrogen, which should be supplied with, with side dress. So um, I guess I'll stop and ask if there's any questions at this point. Um, Jeff, Janice, you... we, don't, we don't have anything in the Q&A box at the moment. Okay, all right. All right, well then I'll, I'll keep going because I've got about, I've got about 15 more minutes. So once, you know, once we go through that calculation process, any lack needs to be made up or it's is best made up with a side dress application. And again, I talked about urea. There's people go out and broadcast urea with these narrow tire spreaders on the surface. It's cheap. It's fast, but you should definitely use a urease inhibitor in those situations to um, try and minimize any losses of volatilization. This picture is showing um, an injection method, well, an application method using Y drops for side dress. And I spent a little time looking into the research on Y drops, the kind of goo you know, we're a big topic of discussion back around 2016, 2018, as a new method, new, a better method of delivering the nitrogen rate to the, the base of the plants. And that's what these pictures are showing. But the research is um, not as consistent as you would like to see it as to whether that provides a real advantage or not. So in this picture you see here, this is coulter injected, which is between 30 inch rows. So it's in the middle. And then the Y drop is right along the base of the plant by the roots. So the thought is this is more available, easier for uptake by the crop because it's close to the roots. But what the research has shown is that when conditions are dry, there's not necessarily an advantage to, to the Y drops. Um, so they did this study where they put 50% of the nitrogen up front, 50% side dressed at V6, no nitrogen up front, 100% side dressed, and then um, 40 pounds in a two by two of planting, so standard kind of starter, and then the remainder of the nitrogen side dressed at V6. And these were the the yield results that they saw. Um, so this was the use of the coulter where it's injected into the soil. And this is the Y drop. These, there were two different sites. This is over one, one season. So you can see here, there's this is statistically uh, significantly greater, the coulter inject versus the Y drop. And this one, um, they're actually not statistically significantly different. They're similar. So no, no real yield advantage to the Y drop in this experiment in one year when the conditions were very dry. Um, so it's not a clear cut advantage. The advantage for Y drops is not clear cut. And um, I guess you would really have to consider the additional expense. So in this particular study, there was no rainfall within five to eight days of the side dress applications. And so they believe that restricted the movement of the nitrogen into the root zone. And water is like 
it's a critically important piece of the puzzle along with oxygen and the root itself needs some moisture to be able to um, access that nitrogen. And the bottom line is corn nitrogen response is greatly influenced by soil moisture conditions and will require additional. Their conclusion was they needed to uh, test this over other years and environmental conditions. So we worry about where we apply the nitrogen with side dress applications. The reality is that the corn crop has a massive growing root. So regardless of placement, the roots will find the nitrogen if there's enough moisture to move it. Nitrogen moves with the flow of water. So it's actually suctioned by crop roots as long as there's moisture available. Uh, so the nitrogen method of application may not be as uh, critical as some companies might want you to believe. Um, this is just showing the points where nutrient uptake starts to accelerate in the corn crop. And so there's been a lot of talk about, should we spoon feed our corn? Is there any benefit to applying additional nitrogen late in the season once the ear is forming? And so this particular article here said, research shows little or no benefit waiting to apply nitrogen past the V8 stage. So you can see V8, we're getting close to canopying, maybe canopied. Depending on the year, uh, those light nitrogen applications actually had shown some reduced yields. So a side dress at V12 reduced yields compared to V8. So V12 is when things are really starting to accelerate. So maybe possibly they applied it, it was dry and sort of the roots couldn't access it at that moment it needed it. And that may have been why there was a yield reduction. Typically recommend side dressing somewhere between the V4 and V8 stage. The, the, the issue for dairy farmers and the problem with side dressing is if there, it comes at a time when there's so many demands on the farm, there's weed control, there's hay crap that needs to be put in and it can be side dress time for corn. So sometimes it's hard to cover all those bases. And that has led folks to be to put all their nitrogen on up front so they don't have to worry about it. And in that situation, using something like a super U is the best thing to do and not an ideal situation. Because if you don't get in there and side dress, because some years we get too wet and you can't get the equipment in the field or the custom guy can't come, then your crop is short. So, you know, we all play these balancing balance all the factors we're dealing with and try to make the best decision based on the constraints facing us. So I wanted to take a minute and talk about these new products that are hitting the market like crazy, uh, the biologicals. And I borrowed this slide, the next couple of slides from a presentation from a researcher in North Carolina. Um, there's a lot of different factors these microbes can contribute to, like fixing nitrogen, solubilizing phosphorate, phosphorus, um, helping control disease organisms. And I have to say, I think it's exciting. I think it, we're on the cusp of a new era of farming, kind of moving from a chemical age to a biological age. But I think these products are coming so fast and furious and there's not a lot of um, third party research. There's a lot of testimonials. There's um, maybe a lot of company research, but not a lot of, um, you know, replicated research on research farms. So I would, I guess I would say at this point, proceed with caution. And if you were trying these products, try it on a small scale to test them and try to set up some kind of comparison within the field. So <clears throat> we have basically two main categories, the beneficial microbes and the biostimulants. The, um, the beneficial microbes may help 
convert nitrogen in the soil and the biostimulants might increase root growth so that they have access to a wider, uh, the roots have a wider area to explore for nutrients. So they work in different ways. It's important to know how, what your product is supposed to do and how it works. I borrowed these slides from um, Connor Sibyl, who's with uh, the University of Illinois in Urbana. And then, so this is just an example of some of the products that you may be approached about that are on the market currently. Oops. So um, I have about five minutes left. So I want to talk a little bit about some of our problem deficiencies in corn. We can see zinc deficiency in low pH soils. Uh, this picture to the left, I think, is more classic than the picture to the right with that wide band of white in the, in the, along the rib of the plant. Um, <clears throat> so symptoms appear in the youngest leaves. You can confirm it with tissue testing. Cool, wet, and cloudy weather can favor zinc deficiency. So you have to kind of sort out whether it's a true deficiency or if it's a growing uh, growing season induced deficiency. Other things that can contribute are high pH soils, which unless you're along the throughway or in another high line belt are not common in our area. Sandy low organic matter soils, which have low um, nutrient holding capacity. Organic soils, which are the muck soils or soils with high phosphorus levels because phosphorus can tie up zinc. Um, if it's just a weather, early season, cool, wet conditions, the plant will typically outgrow that and you shouldn't see a yield loss from that. So zinc's important because it's involved in the synthesis of proteins. Uh, it's important for calcium translocation and helps with uniform maturity. Um, <clears throat> you, can, uh, you can correct zinc deficiencies with applications of either broadcast or banded fertilizers. But the, for broadcast, you would like to, you should use a zinc chelate so that it's protected in the soil um, or a zinc sulfate. Broadcast applications can remain effective for several, several years if soil conditions allow. Um, on, on the Cornell soil test, if you have a level of one pound per acre, that's considered adequate. And it, it's ha often hard to interpret the micronutrient values on soil tests. The other thing I think I see more commonly now is sulfur deficiency. And it's partly because we're not getting the contribution of sulfur from acid rain. And, um, we see this striping intravenal chlorosis in sulfur. And again, if the early growing conditions are supportive of growth and the crop is growing very rapidly, you will sometimes see symptoms like this. So it's not that there's a true nutrient deficiency, it's just that the crop is growing so rapidly, it can't keep up with all its nutrient needs. So here's a, um, sulfur can look, uh, like a general yellowing of the crop, or it can get into that more uh, severe intravenal chlorosis. And it could possibly be induced by waterlogged soils, colder temperatures, herbicide interactions, or potassium, potassium deficiencies may accompany it. Um, sulfur is important because it's part of amino acids and proteins and um, acidic conditions and poor soil aeration. So those waterlogged soils will um, suppress the availability of sulfur. And I guess um, I don't, I want to end my talk by mentioning the importance of soil health and using practices to support soil health because that in turn is gonna uh, support all 
the things in the in the soil zone to help that plant grow the best it can and yield as much reach its yield potential so uh, cover cropping, reducing tillage, all the things that support soil health, addition of organic inputs from manure or compost, help all these processes that you see on the slide, which in turn support resilient plant growth. So that... Um, that's what I wanted to talk about today. I'd be happy to take any questions. I guess just this closing thought, soil fertility management is more than simply adding nutrients to crops. Healthy soils encourage plant growth, supply nutrients at a time when they are needed by the crops, which you could see is very important in the whole equation that we're using to figure nitrogen needs for corn, improve soil aeration and water holding capacity, and increase soils resilience to compaction, erosion, and stress.